Let's get into the Word of God. Leviticus chapter 23. Lord willing, we're going to complete this chapter tonight, and with it, the most fascinating study uh, of the seven feasts of Israel, as we've been enjoying now for the last, I lost count. I think we've been in this chapter for about a month, haven't we? I don't think anybody's complaining. Uh, we took one feast per week the last couple of weeks because of the richness uh, of their meaning, uh, both historically and prophetically as well. So we're studying the seven feasts of Israel that were given to Israel to celebrate and commemorate over a period of seven months. So let's go to the throne and ask the Lord's blessing on our time in his word if you would join with me. Father, settle our hearts. Focus our attention. Quiet our minds and remove from us any distraction that might keep us from that which you have for us. Lord, we want to hear you speak tonight. We want to see that which it is that you would desire to show us tonight. Lord, we need especially tonight a clarity of thought that we might be able to assimilate all of the information that is woven into the fabric of the text that we have before us. Lord, absent your Holy Spirit, that's just not going to happen. So we're asking you, even begging you for your Holy Spirit to give us that understanding, that insight, not just for the information, but for the much-needed application of the information. So, Lord, again, we would ask that you would remove any distractions, uh, remove any tiredness or fatigue, anything that would cause us to miss something that you might desire to minister to us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, well, as we've been studying these seven feasts, we've seen how they paint a complete prophetic picture of the person of Jesus Christ as the coming Messiah. So I want to quickly, by way of an overview, uh, take a look, actually our, our last look, now at all seven feasts and their prophetic fulfillment. We started off with the first of the seven feasts, the Feast of Passover, and this is the crucifixion. We'll look at this in more detail in just a moment. But the second feast, the unleavened bread, and that's the burial. The third feast, the Feast of First Fruits, and that's the first resurrection or the resurrection. And we'll be looking at that in great detail tonight, and this is why my prayer has been that we have clarity of thought because there is so much here, and I'm hoping tonight that many unanswered questions that have remained unanswered heretofore, eschatologically, as it relates to the end times prophetic program, and more specifically, its timeline, I pray will get answered tonight, specifically as it relates to the first resurrection. Big misunderstanding with regards to the first resurrection. Uh, then we looked at the Feast of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Harvest, or the Feast of Weeks, and this is a prophetic picture of the birth of the church and the church age. And then, of course, a fascinating study last week my favorite study of all time on my favorite topic of all time, the topic of the rapture. And we saw how that was prophetically painted on the canvas of the Feast of Trumpets. Then we're going to look tonight at the Day of Atonement or the Feast of Yom Kippur. And this is a prophetic picture of the second coming. And then lastly, the seventh of the seven feasts is the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tents. And this will be a prophetic picture of not just the Kingdom Age or the Millennium, but also eternity future with the new heavens and the new earth. Now, that's a quick overview, but let's uh, just take a moment and by way of review, uh, look at more detail with these feasts so we can tie it all together in completing them tonight. The Feast of Passover. Everything about every feast points to the person of Jesus Christ and Him crucified and the resurrection. 
it pictures prophetically his first coming and his second coming and everything in between. See, God is introducing the Israelites to their Messiah pre-Bethlehem. He's even introducing them to the cross pre-crucifixion. And it's seen here in the feast of the Passover celebration, which was for the angel of death to pass over the Israelites there in Egypt as they're about to make their exodus by having the blood of a spotless lamb placed on the four posts of their door. And this was to be placed with a hyssop branch in the shape of of a cross. Again, this is a prophetic picture of how Jesus is our Passover lamb with his blood means that the angel of death will so too pass over us. Now, the first three feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread paints the prophetic picture of Christ's burial. What this feast meant to them then was that in the exodus from Egypt, the Israelites had to leave quickly, didn't have time to let the dough rise with the yeast, which is a picture of sin or leaven, uh, another word for it. And so the bread had to be without leaven. Again, the Lord is being introduced to them as their Messiah and his future uh, burial subsequent to his resurrection. Now, what this feast means to us, though we don't celebrate it because it's already been fulfilled and served its purpose, but it means to us that we now leave the old life and die to the old man. Why? Because Jesus is the bread of new life, and Jesus' body, which was the bread broken for us, was without Leaven. It was unleavened bread, and that's what the Feast of Unleavened Bread pictured and portrayed prophetically. The third feast, the Feast of First Fruits, and this feast is a prophetic picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what this feast meant to them then was that at the beginning of the barley harvest, they were to bring a wave offering on the first day of the week, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, the wave offering waved up and down, left and right, of course, in the shape of a cross. And that's what this feast means to us, is that now, with Christ's resurrection, uh, he was the first and the beginning of the first resurrection. And again, we're going to talk about the first resurrection tonight in detail. And the resurrection was on the first day of the week, Sunday. And that's when the Feast of First Fruits was to be celebrated on Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. A picture of the resurrection on that Sunday morning, the first day of the week. The fourth feast, the Feast of Pentecost. Now, this is also known as the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. And what this meant to them then was 50 days after leaving Egypt, the Jews would arrive at Mount Sinai. With fire, they hear the tongue of the Lord. Moses comes down with the law, breaks the tablets because they had broke God's law. And because of their sin, 3,000 people died that day. What does this feast mean to us? Well, instead of 50 days after leaving Egypt, it's 50 days after the resurrection. The disciples are told to tarry there in the upper room on not Mount Sinai, but Mount Zion. There, tongues of fire came down. And the good news of the Lord dying and forgiving the sin of man who broke the law of God was heard. And instead of 3,000 people dying, 3,000 people were harvested that day, added to the church, and were saved on the day of Pentecost. And that was the birth of the church. And that's what the Feast of Pentecost, pent meaning five or 50 days, pictures and ever so beautifully portrays. Then the Feast of Trumpets. We looked at two different kinds of trumpets with two signals. A trumpet of God, the trumpet of angels. The first trumpet, the last trumpet. Which trumpet was for Israel? Which trumpet for the church? A distinction very clearly and explicitly is given in the scriptures as it relates to the signals of these two different trumpets 
and what they meant. Now, what they meant to them then was that on the first day of the month of Tishri, on the Jewish ceremonial calendar, the Feast of Trumpets was held. Trumpets were blown to gather together God's people for a holy convocation, relocation, and or confrontation. And that's what it means to us now. The Feast of Trumpets is a picture of a holy convocation, which is an assembling or a gathering together of God's people at the sound of a trumpet for the relocation uh, we call the rapture of the church. And we looked at all of the typology, how the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, picture the Jews and how Daniel pictures the church. We looked at how Noah and his family picture the Jews. They go into the flood and they make it through the flood. We'll talk a little bit more about the days of Noah tonight as well. But more specifically, we talked about how Enoch is a picture of the church. See, Enoch was pre-flood. Daniel was pre-furnace. And we looked at, we look, so they picture the church and the church is pre-tribulation. Now that's where we pick it up tonight, verse 26. So if you'll follow along with me, Leviticus 23, verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, also the 10th day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening from evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Remember now the Jews to this day their day starts in the evening. It goes evening to evening. Not like us, morning to uh, morning. Well, this is again the Day of Atonement or Yom, which in Arabic and Hebrew means day, Kippur Atonement, the Day of Atonement. And it is a prophetic picture of the second coming. Again, notice the progression. Notice the timeline. We start off with the death, burial, resurrection. Then we go to the, uh, the, uh, 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 the birth of the church. We go to the Feast of Trumpets. We go to the uh, uh, second coming. And then we're going to go to eternity future. Everything is perfectly in order because God is perfect and he's a God of order. Now, what was the Day of Atonement? Well, it was only one day a year where the high priest would enter the holy place, the most holy place, to make atonement for Israel's sins. And it could only be on that one day of the year. And it could not just be a priest. It had to be the high priest. Again, picturing Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, who has made atonement for us instead of of us. Now, atonement's one of those really cool words that says what it means and means what it says. At one meant. See, sin separates us from God. If atonement is made, we are reunited with God and once again at one meant with Him. I love those words. I love another word like that. Uh, justified. It's just if I'd never sinned. I know that's not proper English, but it works, right? Ju you're justified. Why? Because he paid the penalty for my sin. And it's just if I'd never sinned. And atonement means I'm at one man because of my high priest, Jesus Christ, who on that day made atonement for my sins. And that's what the high priest 
would do. And that's who the high priest would be a foreshadow of. Now, interesting, did you notice several times there it was to be a day of affliction? There's a reason for that. The day of atonement or Yom Kippur represents the affliction and salvation of Israel during the seven year tribulation and the day of the Lord or second coming after or at the end of the tribulation. See, they will be afflicted when on that day of atonement, Israel will look upon him whom they have pierced, repent of their sins, and receive Jesus as their Messiah. Consider Zechariah the prophet, chapter 12, speaking of this, verses 10 and 11. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. See, when they realize at the end of the seven-year tribulation that Jesus was there, in Arabic we say, Messiah, in Hebrew, Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one, the Savior, the only one, they're going to be grieving because they're going to be realizing in their affliction that it was they who pierced him and they will mourn because of him when they realize that it was him. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11, you can turn there if you'd like. I'd like to read a, a number of verses here. Very key and very germane to our understanding of not just this feast, but God's plan for his chosen people, the Jews. Now, I don't remember if I talked about this on Saturday. I've got the memory of a gnat, so you'll bear with me. Uh, but I want to just talk real quickly that about God's plan for the Jewish people. God is not through with the Jewish people. And we don't want him to be through with the Jewish people because he has a covenant with the Jewish people. He has a covenant with us as well. And if the covenant with Israel is that tentative, then how secure are we in the new covenant? See, if Israel has messed up and blown it, and now God is all of a sudden through with the Jew, then what's to say that something might happen and he too will be through with me and you? May it never be, and it will never be, and here's why. The Bible says it's an everlasting covenant. I looked up the word everlasting in the original language. You know what it means? Everlasting. <laughs> Listen, I'm not trying to be cute or coy. It just, you know, I, I'm not the, the brightest bulb in the pack, but it's pretty clear to me that usually when you read God's word, God says what he means and means what he says. An everlasting covenant means it's a covenant that will last forever. Forever. That's pretty long. That's the covenant he has with Israel. He is not through with the Jew. May it never be. He has a plan. But the plan he has for the Jewish people is not the same as the plan that he has for his bride. There is a distinction. Israel is the wife of Jeho Jehovah and the church, the bride of Christ. And there is a distinction and it's very clear in the pages of Holy Writ. Now the Apostle Paul is going to speak to this in some very blunt terms. And I don't ever imagine the beloved Apostle ever pulling punches. I mean, you know, here's a guy after everything he had been through. And I mean, I don't ever imagine him being, uh, you know, really sensitive, you know, to people's feelings. I mean, he was just the kind of, I mean, he was a very gracious man, a very loving man. And he loved the Jewish people so much so that he said to God that he would be accursed or damned to hell if it meant 
that his brethren, the Jewish people, would come to a saving knowledge of their true Messiah, Jesus Christ. That's how much he loved the Jewish people. Now, I say that to say this. He's going to address very bluntly this notion in the Roman church, the church there in Rome, that God has not rejected his people. Listen to what he says, chapter 11, verse 1. I ask them, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, watch this, there is a remnant chosen by grace, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would be no longer grace. I love the book of Romans. I'm praying about where we're going to go after we're done with the book of Acts. It, yeah, I've already got a few amens. You bear witness with that. Well, praise God. Uh, maybe we go into the book of Romans. What a book. What a book. What a book. Oh, my goodness. Now, verse 25, same chapter, Romans 11. Watch what he says. I don't want you to be ignorant. Could you imagine preachers, pastors today in the pulpit saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. And here, you know, here's the person visiting the church. Did the pastor just call me ignorant? I'll never, the nerve of him, I'll never come back to a church like this again. Listen, this is the truth. You are ignorant. You are ignorant if you think God has rejected his people. That is ignorance. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this ministry, mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel, listen, Romans eleven twenty six 26 should be in every Jew and Arab and Gentile Bible that is in this church tonight. It should be underlined and highlighted and noted and even memorized because it says, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, a.k.a. Israel. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. What day is he talking about? The last day, the day of the Lord, the day of atonement at the end of the seven year tribulation. And that's exactly and precisely what this feast, Yom Kippur, speaks to and points to and will ultimately be fulfilled in on that day. Verse 33. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. There's that word again, convocation. An assembling, a gathering, as we looked at last week. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the, watch this, eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly and you shall do no customary work on it. Put that in your hip pocket. That's the eighth day, not the seventh, the eighth. There's a reason for it. We'll see in a moment. These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be a holy, to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day. Besides, verse 38, the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord also. 
On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest. And here it is again. On the eighth day a Sabbath rest. Again, put that in your hip pocket. Verse 40, And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in, watch this, booths. For seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses, verse 44, declared to the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. Well, that ends and completes the seven feasts with the seventh feast known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. It can also be referred to as the Feast of Tents. Now, what does this feast uh, portray and point to? Well, it's a beautiful prophetic picture of eternity. And in a twofold way, it points to both the millennium and heaven. You know, in always thinking about longing for and wanting the rapture and then the second coming, we always kind of rush through that 1,000 year period called the kingdom age or the millennium where we will rule and reign with the Lord here on earth before the new heavens and the new earth. And guess what? And we'll talk about this more in a moment. Earth will be what it was like pre-fall, pre-Adam and Eve allowing sin to enter the world. Interesting study if you ever want to do it on the millennium. We'll talk about it uh, more uh, here uh, shortly. But suffice it to say, and be that as it may, this was a prophetic picture of the Feast of Tabernacles. Pictured here as a modern day tabernacle because this feast is still celebrated in Israel to this day. So they, because they're still waiting for their Messiah. But believers don't celebrate, there's no need. Because again, remember now, these were signs, Moad in Arabic or Hebrew, Moad, an appointed time. They pointed to a time yet future. See, so just like that sign that points me to my final destination has served its purpose when I've arrived at my final destination, I don't need this sign anymore because I've arrived. See, Jesus, when he arrived at his destination at the first coming, served the purpose and fulfilled those feasts, those signs, those moads, those festivals, because all they did and all they were intended to do was to point Israel to the first and final destination of their coming Messiah when he came to earth as their Messiah. So they still celebrate because they're still waiting for him to come. They're still waiting for him to come. Again, going back to Romans, germane to our understanding. It's because there's still a blindness for Israel. That's why it absolutely jams your gears and my gears when you meet a Jew and you share with them the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They just, it's a blank look. They cannot get it because they're blind. But you know what's interesting? And again, Romans... At some point, they're going to become so jealous of our relationship with their God. Now, for me, as a full-on Arab, that really messes them up. <laughs> because I, I am an Arab slash Gentile who has a personal saving relationship with their Messiah. And they cannot get it. And it just, it is. And I just lost my mic. It's back. All right. 
I once was lost, now it's saved. So we're back. So interesting though, this Feast of Tabernacles celebrated to this day as pictured here was a commemorating and a celebrating of God's provision in the wilderness while bringing them in to the promised land. And this is really what it means for us. Now, uh, you have to turn there. John 1.14. I hope you already know the verse. If you don't, you really should know John 1. Because that is the acid test when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ. Hey, whenever I'm talking to a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness, John, uh, John 1. Now, they, Jehovah Witnesses have their, their own, uh, you know, uh, translation of the Bible. And they've completely uh, butchered uh, the text making it say what they wanted to say in order to support their twisted and perverted and blasphemous doctrine that states that Jesus is not God. I know that's blunt, isn't it? Yeah, me and Paul. Me and Paul. I love, I, <laughs> that's where I get it. That's my excuse anyway. So uh, if you don't like that excuse, I've got three or four more you can pick from. But it's true. It is a false doctrine. And the Jesus Christ... Uh, who was I? I was talking with uh, one of my sons. It was either Eli I think it was Levi. I was talking with him. No, it was, I think it was uh, Elias uh, because we were talking about how Mormons are called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that was kind of confusing to him. And so I had to explain to him that the Jesus Christ of the Mormon Church is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. See, their Jesus is not God. And if Jesus isn't God, then open up your Bible. Don't do this at home. <laughs> rip out John 1. In fact, you're going to have to rip out a large portion of the sacred scriptures because He is God, and that is the litmus test by which you can gauge whether or not a cult is a cult or not. Is Jesus God? No, He's Lord. He's Savior. He's Redeemer. We have nothing to talk about. If Jesus isn't God, you have believed and been deceived into believing a lie. And you will perish in hell for all eternity because the Jesus that you are trusting in is not the Jesus that will save. Because the Jesus that is in the Bible is the second person of the Trinity. He is God the Son, God with us, Emmanuel. Does it get any clearer than that? I'm not upset. I'm just saying that he's God. Okay? All right. I feel better now. I hope you do too. Where was I? I completely lost whatever it was. A profound point too that I was going to make on this Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, okay. So, well, what does the Feast of Tabernacles mean to us? Well, it points to us as being brought out of our wilderness, the world, into heaven, the promised land. See, God provided this through Jesus, who, by the way, I don't want to ruin anybody's Christmas, but it is believed that Jesus was born on the Feast of Tabernacles, which was in October. Merry Christmas. <laughs> now think about this. Now here's where John 1.14 comes into place. Well, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Okay? 1.14, and the Word became flesh and... You guys, let's just close in prayer. I'm, this is, you guys are so well taught. The Word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not... The, 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 yeah. Think it through. What's a tabernacle? It's a tent. God became a man and clothed himself, tabernacled himself in an earthly tent and became a man. Fully God and fully man. That's what the tabernacle is. He is the tabernacle. The, the, the camp, I can't wait till we get the numbers. I, the, did he say numbers? Yeah, the book of numbers. What's in the book of numbers? A bunch of numbers. Book of numbers, numbers. It's the numbering of the Israelites. 
But you know what's interesting about the book of Numbers, which is about the numbers of the Israelites, is that they were to camp in X numbers to the south, Y numbers to the uh, north, and then also to the east. And you have the numbers in the book of Numbers, which is why it's called the book of Numbers. So you have the numbers going to the south, north, east, and west. And where's the tabernacle? Right smack in the middle of the camp of the Israelites in all of their numbers. Now, you know what's really cool? We know we talked about this, but for the benefit of those who weren't here, do you know what the shape, if you take those numbers in the book of Numbers and you look at the numbers to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west with the tabernacle right smack in the middle, do you know what you got? A cross. A cross. Did, what a coincidence. What are the odds of that happening? How about Numbers chapter, I think it's about 22. Remember the story about Balaam and Balak? How Balak pays Balaam big bucks to pronounce a curse on the Israelites? Why did he want to curse the Israelites? He was threatened by the Israelites. Why was he threatened by the Israelites? Because they were increasing in numbers. <laughs> they're going to take over they're because they're increasing in numbers. Have you seen the numbers? Yeah, it's in the book of Numbers. And so Balak is deeply concerned and wants to pronounce a curse on them. So he hires Balak, who, or Balak and who gets on this donkey and goes to curse the Israelites. And only a blessing can come out. It's kind of like, I, I, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. And I mean, out comes the ironic blessing, which by the way, is also in Numbers. The book of Numbers, the ironic blessing, Numbers chapter 6. Let's just go to the book of Numbers right now. Numbers, let's begin in, I can't wait. What's my point? Do I have one? Yes, I do. Because we read that Balak took Balaam to a higher place on the mountain said you know I don't know why you're only you know blessing them instead of cursing them I'm paying you a lot of money to curse them so why don't we try a different location and you pronounce the curse from there now imagine here's Balaam He's trying to curse the Israelites. He's in a high mountain. He's got almost a bird's eye view of the children of Israel in the camp in the shape based on the numbers with the tabernacle smack in the middle. And that is why he could not curse the Israelites because of the cross. And there is therefore now no curse or condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. Why? Because of the finished work on the cross. Because the one who would finish the work on the cross would become flesh and tabernacle amongst us. Take that, Balak. Okay. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, also known as the Feast of Booths. This is interesting. Here's another picture. Uh, modern day Israel, an apartment building with booths. In October, you'll, if we go in October, by the way, uh, you might see some of these because they're celebrating the Feast of Booths to this day uh, in modern day uh, Israel. Now, they believe and celebrate, as we just read, that this was a remembrance of God's miraculous provision for their forefathers who slept in booths under the stars for 40 years, 40 the number of judgment before bringing them into the promised land. Now this is rich with what I call scripture pictures because it was like it was in the days of Noah. Now stay with me here. This is really important and really interesting and really fascinating. See, it also speaks to how Noah, who is a picture of the Jews, was brought into a new earth promised land after 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Again, 40 in Bible numerology. Now, this is not the, the numerology you think of, the, you know, the occultic kind, but numbers have meanings in the scripture. Five grace, six man, seven completion, eight new beginnings, and so on and so forth. Forty is judgment. So you have uh, Jonah, 
uh, 40 days uh, he preaches. He doesn't even preach a, a salvation message. And everybody gets saved. And he's mad. Uh, the, the book, the, Jonah is... A, it, it, now contrast Jonah with Jeremiah. I don't mean to get off on a rabbit trail here, but think about this. Here's Jeremiah preaching a gospel message of repentance. Jonah never preached repentance. He just said, 40 days, you're toast. And he w was, was sweat to sick because he couldn't wait. He's marking them off on his calendar. He's waiting for God. He wants God to absolutely obliterate them. And instead they, they turn and they repent and they get saved. And Jonah is ticked at God. Now contrast him with Jeremiah. Preaches the weeping prophet, not one conversion. Who's going to get asked to speak at a pastor's conference? <laughs> Jonah or Jeremiah? I mean, I don't know that I'm going to invite Jonah. I mean, here's the, you know, the reluctant prophet runs from God, you know? Anyway, Jonah's a great book too. What a great, when he gets barfed out on the beach, the stomach acids from the great fish, likely a whale, had bleached him and he was albino white. Now think about this. The Ninevites believed in a fish god. I, call me silly, but, you know, a, a fish that I think is God barfs out this, you know, guy on the, on the beach and he starts, you know, telling me I need to, you know, <laughs> that it, judgment's coming. I'm listening. I, I don't, I, I'm, you, you've got my attention. I, did you hear what he just said? Yeah. Oh, is that the guy that was barfed out by a fish? Yeah. Don't we believe the, the fish God? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> we need to do something about this. And that's, anyway, okay, I digress. Now, so you've got the 40 days and the 40 nights, 40 being a, a number in the Bible speaking to judgment. Now, as we learn in our study of the Feast of Trumpets, you have Enoch, a picture of the church who was raptured, caught up to meet the Lord before the world was judged with the flood. Now, what makes this even more interesting is that Jesus said that the world would be like it was in the days of Noah, right before the second coming, when the world is judged by fire. Now, I'm not going to take the time, because I don't have the time tonight. We did this way back when we were in Matthew. But Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so too will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. If you ever want to do a fascinating study there are some parallels between the days of Noah and our day today that are clearly exactly what the Lord said they would be like. Here's one. I'll just give you one. Did you know that it's believed that the population of planet Earth in Noah's day prior to the flood was over 6 billion with a B people? We're over 6 billion today. That was the population of planet Earth. And that's just one. You can, some uh, astronomers, not astrologers, have gotten into the whole study of, for example, Hale-Bopp Comet. You know the last time Hale-Bopp Comet came uh, it, as close to in its orbit to planet Earth uh, like it did back in the 90s? You remember Hale-Bopp Comet? Yeah. It was in the days of Noah. And you've got all of these things that are parallel to uh, and likened unto the days of Noah. I wish we had time. That's a study unto itself. But uh, again, a prophetic uh, picture of what the Lord said it would be like. All right. Well, let's try to bring this in for a landing because there's a lot of material here I want to uh, talk about. Water was an important part of the Feast of Tabernacles. In Old Testament biblical times, gold pitchers of water were brought from the pool of Siloam. Remember the Siloam, or however you want to pronounce it. Remember when we were there, for those of you that went to Israel with us? They would take uh, from this pool the water, and they would take it uh, to the temple. Then the priest would pour out the water over the altar and recite from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. What does that say? It says this. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will, watch this, draw water from the wells of salvation. See, it was a symbol of all the water that God provided out of the rock while in the desert. Now, this is where you need to take the eighth day 
out of your hip pocket because it was the eighth day that there was no procession from the pool of Siloam to the temple because on that day, the eighth day, God will have and would have fulfilled his promise by bringing them into the promised land. Thus the tabernacles or booth had been completed and fulfilled. Now, John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. This is where it gets really excited because this is where Jesus declares that he fulfills this feast when he was in the temple on the very day of the feast. He was in the temple on the eighth day and he proclaimed himself to be the very fountain of living water. Now listen to what John 7, 37, 38 records. On the last and greatest day of the feast, which day? The eighth day. Which feast? The feast of tabernacles. Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. Now you'll forgive me here, okay? It says in a loud voice. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. What's he saying? What's he shouting in a loud voice? Hey, I am the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. I am the water. I am the fulfillment on the very day. You don't need to go to the pool to get the water because the water of everlasting life is here standing before you, offering you the water of everlasting life. If from it you will drink, you will never thirst again. And he fulfilled it on that day, in that place, at that time, exactly as God's word said it would be. Now fast forward to Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 through 6. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. John 1, 14. And he dwell, will dwell with them. John 1, 14. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Neither, uh, uh, listen, if, you, if you're ever discouraged, you, you need to, Revelation 21 verses 3 through 6 should be on your refrigerator or on your wall, okay, or on tap or even on, written on the tablets of your heart because God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, speaking of John, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And watch this. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He's the water. He's the water. He's the feast. He's the fulfillment of the feast. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes left. I know none of you are watching your watches. And if you are, we won't say anything. <laughs> God will forgive you. No. We got 10 more minutes and I would be grossly remiss to not end with an eschatological timeline of how history and prophecy will end in the biblical timeline as we see ever so beautifully painted and portrayed and packaged here with these seven feasts. What I want to do is I want to take you from the next event on God's prophetic calendar all the way to the new heavens and the new earth and give you a timeline of sorts or a chart, 
if you will, so you can have a better understanding of how it's all going to play out, starting with the next event, the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. That's the next event. The timing before the tribulation. I think we've argued that case uh, ad nauseum uh, over the past several weeks, but the rapture of the church has to take place before the seven-year tribulation. Now, what is the rapture? Well, by way of explanation, it's where born-again Christians who are waiting and watching will be taken up, caught up, raptured up to meet Jesus Christ. He will take us as his bride to his Father's house where he is even now preparing a place for us, a bridal chamber. And that was the Feast of Trumpets. What's the duration? The twinkling of an eye. Not a blink. A twinkling of an eye has been likened unto a sparkle. It's an, almost an immeasurable... Hey, it's going to be really fast. It's going to be really fast. All right. Now what happens after that? The next event is the first resurrection. I want to spend just a little bit of time on this real quickly. The timing. The first resurrection started when Jesus Christ was first resurrected on the first day of the week, the Feast of First Fruits. Okay, what is it? A bodily resurrection of those who died in Christ are caught up to meet together with us who are alive and remain at the rapture and are forever with the Lord. What's the duration of this event? Approximately two thousand years. Now, let me explain, because the bride is not the only one to take part in the first resurrection. One commentator put it this way, Jesus declared in John 5, 28 and 29 that there would be two categories of resurrection, a resurrection of life and a resurrection of death or condemnation. Those who are genuine believers will be part of the first resurrection and those that are lost will experience the second. It's important to understand that his focus was on the kind of resurrection, not the time of resurrection. Note the following. The Apostle Paul used a Greek term in relation to the stages of the first resurrection. The Greek word is tagma, uh, each in his own order. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, the first part. This is a military term frequently used to designate a division or a battalion of soldiers. Paul pictures a military battalion passing by a reviewing stand at different intervals of time and relates this to the first resurrection. So there are different stages or battalions Italians, if you will, that come under the category of the first resurrection. It started again with Jesus Christ almost 2,000 years ago, uh, the first fruits of all who would follow. The second battalion, the second division, a token number of saints. Matthew 27, 51 through 53. Remember when he gave, gave up his spirit into... You know, and, and Christ died on the cross at the ninth hour, exactly at the time. And the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn from top to bottom. We're told, Matthew records for us, that tombs were opened and there was a resurrection of a number of saints at that time. And that was really the second battalion. What's the third division or the third battalion? The rapture the church, the bride, the Christians. Now there's a fourth battalion. The two witnesses who are martyred in Revelation 11, 1 through 14. There's a fifth battalion. The tribulation saints who are beheaded and martyred, having not accepted the mark of the Antichrist. The sixth battalion are the Old Testament saints which we'll see in Daniel, or Daniel 12, 1 and 2, and Isaiah 26, 19. I have all the scripture references again on the handouts. Please, if you want to download them, this is a fascinating study. But you've got several divisions or battalions all constituting the first resurrection over a period of time. Now, please, 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 this is a bodily resurrection. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
What was he saying? Well, this is the best way I've ever been able to describe it or understand it. And this is how I explain it whenever I do a memorial service. When I did my daughter's memorial service, this is how I understood it. Okay. We are created in God's image, triune in nature. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. Okay. When we die, our body goes into the ground, dust to dust from where it was created. Our spirit goes to be with the Lord, and we cease, because we're deceased, we cease to be a living soul. Okay. You have a light bulb, three parts. You've got the bulb, you got the electricity, and you got the light that is created when you bring the bulb and the electricity together. Now, when the bulb dies or is ceases, uh, what do you do with the bulb? You put it in the rubbish, it goes to the ground from where it was created, dust to dust. That's the body. Where does the electricity go? It goes back to its source. Electricity, like the spirit, goes back to and is present with the source. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, sealing us, that, that deposit, if you will, born again of the Holy Spirit, that's what Paul was saying, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord in spirit. Now, where's our soul? Well, we're not a living soul until when we who are alive and remain are caught up, given our new bodies, and the dead in Christ are resurrected first as part of the first resurrection, they're given their new bodies, and the Spirit with their new body creates a living soul for all eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't wait for my new body because this one got miles on it, man. <laughs> it is like way out of warranty, and it is totaled, it is salvaged, and I want my new body. <laughs> okay? I mean, there are things that are hurting that I never even knew existed in my anatomy now. I get up in the morning, and I make noises. I remember as a kid, <laughs> my parents, you know, would get a, uh, uh, you know, and I'm a kid, and they're making all these noises, and every move, uh, uh, thinking, wow, man, you're old. And now it's me. I'm making the same noises. I'm making more noises anyway. Enough of my problems. So that's the first resurrection. Now, what happens after that? Well, in concert with that, after that, in the duration of that, you have the seven-year tribulation. After the rapture. This is where the Antichrist confirms an existing but uncertain Mideast peace agreement, Daniel 9.27. Notice the verbiage I chose to use because it implies that he confirms, makes certain an agreement that's already in place. In other words, the Antichrist doesn't seem to uh, make the agreement. He just confirms an existing agreement. Then, at the three and a half year mark of the seven year tribulation, he commits an abomination that causes desolation. And God's wrath is poured out on the earth, which leads to the Battle of Armageddon. Battle of Gog, Ezekiel 38, Battle of Armageddon, Revelation are like bookends on the seven-year tribulation. Uh, Armageddon at the end, Gog at the beginning. Bookends on the seven-year tribulation. Now, the duration, of course, seven years. What's the next event? The second coming. When? After the tribulation. This is where the Lord returns to the earth with us, his bride. Every eye will see, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Can't wait for that. See, at the rapture, he comes for us. At the second coming, he comes with us, which means that we get to watch this. <laughs> I wonder if we're going to get to say, I told you so. I told you so, because you're going to bow. You're going to confess at some point. Okay, what's the next event? The millennium. This is after the second coming. What is it? Well, the devil is cast into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years, which is what a millennium is. Those who don't take the mark are beheaded, and they're still saved. They're the tribulation saints. Take part in the first resurrection, Revelation 21 through 4. And the rest remain dead until the end of the millennium. And they don't take part in the first resurrection, but the second resurrection unto condemnation. Again, here's the duration, 1,000 years. Now, let me just speak real quickly, and we're almost done. 
What is the millennium? Now think it through with me. You've got 1,000 years where Satan is, is bound with, in the bottomless pit with one angel, by the way. It's interesting. I, Revelation 20, you can read it. Uh, I, I would think it would take a whole heavenly host. And, and the angel is not even an archangel and no name, just an angel uh, binds Satan in the bottomless pit with a chain. That's interesting to me. Anyway, I think saying that to say this, I think sometimes we give Satan way too much power. Way too much. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He is a created being. And only one angel. It only takes one angel. Anyway, he's bound for a thousand years. He cannot tempt man. Now, does that mean we're going to be tempted in the millennium? No. But we'll be given our glorified bodies. We're going to be ruling and reigning, seated with the bride on the throne. The tribulation saints will be serving him at the throne. Again, there's a difference. Those saved during the tribulation. Now, what about the people that make it through the tribulation having neither accepted the mark nor accepted Christ? They're going to enter the millennium. God will judge. He'll separate them. But they will be uh, allowed entrance into the kingdom age. And they will have bodies, not glorified bodies, they won't be serving at the throne. They won't be seated on the throne. They'll be prolific like Adam and Eve and they will have children and their children will have children and their children's children will have children and they will live in a state of enforced righteousness as we rule with Christ on earth in its pre-fallen state for 1,000 years. That's the millennium. And all of those children that are born during the millennium will live like Adam and Eve a thousand years. And at the end of the millennium comes the final battle. And if there's a chilling, haunting passage in the Bible that is hard to get your mind around, it's this. Because after the millennium, the devil is loosed, deceives a multitude and gathers them to battle. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. And the devil is cast into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever. There's no duration mentioned. I think it's a quick battle. But it's hard to imagine that people that lived in that state of righteousness on earth in its pre-fallen state, no devil would choose the devil at the end of the millennium. And we're told that he will gather and he will deceive a multitude. And that word multitude implies a large number of people. Hard to imagine. Hard to imagine. What happens next? Well, the final judgment. After the final battle. This is the great white throne judgment different than the Bema seat of Christ. This is where every man is judged. The book of life is open. And we are given our rewards. But, according to our works, but uh, we do not partake of the uh, great white throne judgment. Now, if I can just, in your mind, just picture, we just finished the Winter Olympics. For us, the Bema seat is going to be like receiving the gold medals and the bronze medals and the silver medals. And believe you me, nobody is going to be, go, I can't believe I didn't get the gold medal. I got robbed. I was a better Christian than they were. It won't be like that at all. We're all going to be rewarded according to that which we've done. So the Bema seat, like the judges at the Olympics, they judge your performance and they reward you accordingly. That's what our judgment's going to be. Conversely, contrasted by the great white throne judgment, it won't be rewards that they're given. It will be the penalties that they're given. And that's what the great white throne judgment is. And that's when it takes place. And there's no duration mentioned. What happens after that? The second death. When? After the final judgment. This is where death and hell are cast into the lake of fire along with anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life. And the duration for all eternity. Listen, hell has to be forever. If hell isn't forever, then heaven can't be forever. Okay? It's, it, 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 does, it doesn't jive, if I can use that word. The last event is the new heavens 
and the new earth and it's after the second death and this is where the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven and God himself will be with us and will wipe away all of our tears from our eyes and this is where Revelation 21 tells us that there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain and it will be for all eternity. Okay. Let me close this way. Why didn't God, when Lucifer sinned in heaven, which is why we need the new heaven and a new earth, because the first sin was in heaven, then on earth, why didn't God just zap it? I would have, that's what I would have done. I would have just, oh, you want to ascend your throne above the Most High? Do you? Really? Come here. Stop. <laughs> He's gone. See ya. Next, I can create another angel of, of music, angel of the harp. Watch me. Why didn't he do that? Because sin needed to run its course. Now think this through with me, and when we're almost done, I really need you to think this through with me, because if you don't understand this, then this study was just a bunch of really gnarly information. Okay? God wants us to serve him out of love, not fear. Could you imagine if God would have just zapped Lucifer on the spot? All of the angels in heaven, it would have changed their relationship with God forever. All of a sudden now it's, oh, did you see what happened to Lucifer the other day? Oh my goodness, he got off on this thing. I'm going to ascend my throne and God just zapped him on the spot. We better watch our P's and Q's. <laughs> They're walking on eggshells, heavenly eggshells. Ooh, don't want to cross God. He'll just zap us. We're gone. See, by letting sin run its course, he could also... Let grace abound. Where did sin abound, there did grace much more abound. And by the way, think of it this way, had God not done it that way, you and I wouldn't be here today. The recipients of his unfailing and infinite and unfathomable love. God has a plan. And he's introduced that plan for man to them with these seven complete feasts. See, again, what was the whole Mount Sinai, the whole law thing, the whole Ten Commandments thing? Those Ten Commandments were not given for us to keep. God knew we couldn't keep them. Well, then why did he give us Ten Commandments that he knew we couldn't keep, that he knew we were going to break? I can't imagine God in heaven when Moses comes down and they're doing the whole calf thing and they've got this whole, you know, thing that they're doing. I won't get graphic. I can't imagine that God's going, I just wrote the Ten Commandments. They've already broken them. Moses, get back up here. What went wrong? Where did I go wrong? The purpose of the law was to show us us and to show us what sin looked like. Paul said, I'd have never known that covetousness was sin had it not been in the law and for the law that says this is sin. See, God is using the law like a mirror to show me my condition. And when I see me, in the mirror of God's law, then I realize I need God's love. And like a tutor, the law takes me by the hand to the Savior. See, if I don't see me in the law of God, the mirror of God's law, I'll never see myself as a sinner. And if I never see myself as a sinner, I'll never see my need for the Savior. 
And if I never see my need for the Savior, I'll never know the love of God and that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish in hell for all eternity but have everlasting life. That ties it all together for me. That puts all the pieces in the puzzle together for me and now I get the picture. I see the whole picture. <gasps> Do you ever do that? I mean, I'll be reading my Bible and I just go, <laughs> wow. I mean, there's no words. It's just, God, you are so good. God, you must really love me. You went to a lot of trouble here. That's a lot. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. He went to a lot of, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just start all over? Because I love you. I love you. And my love for you is such that I want you to see this is what sin does to you, but this is what I've done for you in light of what sin has done to you. Why don't you all stand? Lord, how could we possibly thank you enough for your love for us? We can't even begin to fathom it, let alone express our gratitude to you for it. Really, our only consolation is, is that we're going to have all eternity there before the throne worshiping you for who you are and for what you've done because of your love for us. Lord, will you take this study tonight as even lengthy as it was and will you break it down for us by the Holy Spirit that we might be able to assimilate it into our lives? Lord, somehow build this bridge between the academic and the applicable, the information and the application that this that we've seen here tonight is applied to our lives. Lord, I pray that we leave here tonight with a greater understanding of who this God is that we serve. Who is like unto you, God? Thank you, Lord. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name.